So I have two good questions that I want to answer and briefly. Is there another question? Yes. About the, your proof that this is really a fundamental domain, did you don't you need also to somehow say that no translator will intersect? Yes, that? yes, that was one question that was really asked. Uh, asked. Um, you have to do that independently, yes. And I think what you have to do, I don't know the details in my head, you just take a set in the fundamental domain, look at an ABCD, assume that it's also in the fundamental domain. From that, you deduce some inequalities, like the imaginary part is quite big. But the imaginary part is a simple formula you have to calculate it. Like might be just one of the set, C set plus D absolute value or something. And because that's quite big, you need, you realize that C set plus D must be quite small. Which means since Z is quite big, C should probably not be there, which kills one coefficient already and you keep going. So that's something you have to do independently. For what follows, it doesn't matter much because we will show in a minute that F has finite volume. And if F is not really a fundamental domain because you might get that this point is equivalent to that point or whatever, which doesn't happen, then you may have to choose an even smaller fundamental domain which also has finite volume. For all I care, for what follows is that I want to know that my motion is finite volume. But I will keep working with this picture because it's a correct picture. Um, there's one question. The other question is what, how does the fundamental domain look like in SL2R or PSL2R, right? Or in T1H? And there the answer is you just need to take all the tangent vectors at all the points of the fundamental domain, yes. the base point in the fundamental domain that you constructed previously. Okay. Any other questions? Could, could you repeat the second question? Second question was, how does the fundamental domain look like in T1H? Thank you. And the answer is take all possible vectors, attach to all possible points in the original fundamental domain. Okay. Then we move on. Is there a last question to the subject at hand? Um, let me give you a picture of another complex quotient. But I don't want to construct any of these other, even though they're, they're somewhat easier, but they're harder to find somehow. And the picture is quite Easy to draw, so that it's more picture. Looks nice. So you can somehow find a discrete subgroup, gamma, so that H mod gamma looks like this. Meaning, so that H mod gamma is a compact surface. You can have that, you can have more handles, you can somehow smooth. Sm very few handles is not so possible. Like, you don't get the torus picture. But once you have more than one hole, then you can realize it as H mod gamma. And in many different ways, you can also attach here some, some extra surface that is a bit smaller or whatever. So there are many, many, many such things. And we will also talk about these. So, definition, gamma is a lattice if H mod gamma has finite volume. E.g. gamma equals SL to Z, as we will see. Gamma is a uniform like this. Also called co-compact like this. If 
H mod gamma is compact. Compact implies finite volume, but not the other way around. And yeah. The, the nicest, the quickest example to, to state is SL2Z, but it's just a lattice, not a uniform lattice. Um, yes? What is uniform about co compact lattices? Um, what is uniform is a good question. The thing that is uniform is the injectivity radius. But um, let me draw, point it out here. So if you go up high, high into the cusp, and you take a point, and you look at the 1 over 10 ball, then it doesn't look like that. It looks like that, and it stretches over many fundamental domains. Which means the, the radius that you need to take so that you get only, that you get um, no equivalent points in the ball, that radius is uniform in a compact portion, but not uniform in a non compact portion. So uniform in the sense? Say it again? That is looking something at a, So in, uniform in that sense, in previous sense, say. If you, if you have finite volume and you have unif uniform injectivity radius, then you're called compact. It's equivalent. And both verbs are used, but it's just a definition. Good questions, now you finally woke up. <laughs> okay, now the other thing that you should have asked me, but maybe I promised you anyway, to talk about this is the final volume business. So, let me switch the pen and start talking about the volume. In particular, we want to calculate the volume of our triangle that we have seen. And then at least we fit into the second category that has been talked about yes, uh, in the morning. Right? The first cat category was a continuous transformation of a compact metric space. Well, we don't quite fit that because we are not compact. But the second category was measure preserving transformations of a final volume object. OK. What's the volume? form, measure, etc. And somehow again it comes from the abstract machinery, from the Riemannian metric machinery. You started with the, this notion of length, back, um, so that was giving you a notion of length for tangent vectors. But actually it gives you also a notion of inner, inner product. You just think this is the, the length of with respect to an inner product squared, right? Because you need to take the square root, of course. And once you have the notion of a Euclidean length, you also have an inner product. Once you have an inner product, then you can define the volume out of it. Because once you have an inner product, you know what the, you can do orthogonal projections, calculate volumes as well, and etc. So the right volume form that gets out of it, this discussion is the x dy over y squared. That's the, and you check, you can check it independently that this is again invariant under gamma. So if you want to calculate the volume of some whatever domain, rectangle, parallelepipede in the hyperbolic plane, you just parameterize it by uh, Two parameter in a two-parameter way, and then use this as your definition of the local volume. And you will see that under gamma, uh, the parallel may shrink if you think of it repeatedly, but the over y squared fixes everything nicely, and you get again that it's invariant. So volume of a set A, A and H is just defined as integral over A, dx, dy, over y squared. And you check this is SL2R invariant. 
which is sort of automatic because it's derived from the Riemannian metric and the Riemannian metric was preserved. You can also think of it this way, then you only have to do the calculation once. Okay? But now we have a very complete fundamental ring for our modular surface, which I'm just erasing. So it's just a stupid calculation to check whether you have a finite volume fundamental domain, because once you have a finite volume fundamental domain, then hopefully you have a finite volume quotient. This was our fundamental domain. And volume of f you can calculate, but it's smaller or equal than the integral from uh, 1 half to infinity, integral from minus 1 half to 1 half, um, 1 over y squared. <coughs> The x is this integration along minus one half one half, that's this integration, and dy is this integration here. And I just use the trivial lower bound for this picture here, one half. But you can also really calculate it, and then you see of course pi's appear and it's very nice. But not so important for us now, because we then define out of this volume a um, a measure on the surface M M H mod gamma of some subset E I define as the volume measure in the hyperbolic plane of I take the pre-image of the real subset of which I want to take the measure but then intersect it with the fundamental domain and call this my volume. So I'm, in terms of the measure theory, I'm just identifying my, my surface with the fundamental domain and use the measure that I have on my fundamental domain. Okay, now it's finite. That's the whole point. This line here, but this is finite. Yeah, we don't have yet a dynamical system, right? Because we said all the time that we need to have unit tangent vectors and not just points on the surface. So we need to extend the whole business here to, to S of 2R or PS of 2R. Um, here's a small trivial remark. I will stop writing PS of 2R because SL2 said mod um, SL2 R. It's actually anyway the same thing as PSL2 set portion by PSL2R. So I will just talk about, I will keep talking about these portions and less and less talk about the T1H and hence also less and less about the PSL2R. And you may say, say that if I change the gamma, then this picture is slightly more general than this picture. Since it's more general, it's even better. But it's almost the same anyway, because any, any quotient here can attach to a particular hyperbolic surface. It's okay. I also need a definition of a measure on SL2R. So I define M SL2R. Well, let's do PSL2R and then forget about the P. Um, Yeah. Ah, I'm cheating. <coughs> Let me cheat for a moment and just define it via the isomorphism to the unit tension bundle of the hyperbolic plane. And this I define as the product of the volume measure on the hyperbolic plane and the Lebesgue measure on the unit circle, which is attached to every point, right? I have the hyperbolic plane and the, the hyperbolic plane at every point I have attached a circuit. And I just used the Lebesgue measure normalized to have volume one on that circuit and define my measure on the unit tangent bundle using this formula. And since the unit tangent bundle is the same as PSL2R, 
I have also defined a measure on PS, PSO2. And since this here is finite, I also get out of this <coughs> discussion that if F prime is the fundamental domain for PSL2 set in PSL2R, then M PSL2R of F prime is less than infinity. And then I can repeat this procedure here and define M of gamma quotient by PSL2R of a Borel set B would be the M PSL2R of you take the pre image under the projection map of this Borel set and then intersect with the set F prime. And this defines a finite measure on X, which is my gamma, my PSL2 R quotient by gamma. And gamma for us is currently the PSL2 set. So let me recall what I what I all said. Uh, may I check the little? So this formula for the, little, okay. for the for the measure of the unit yes. tangent bundle. Yes. You just use any identification of the unit tangent bundle with the product. And it's good. Yeah, it's good. But there's a there's a canonical Yeah, that's one G. Up to maybe not canonical. Maybe, maybe there's a choice in the isomorphism depending on the base point. But once you tell me within one base point what the particular angle corresponds to, then I know what other angle should correspond to. And for me, it's all the same. I mean, let's say. So I could also have said the Vasavati proposition if you are more happy with that, but maybe some others are not so happy with that. So in the background, we, let me emphasize or say a bit about this strange comment. Um, when I checked that SL2R acts transitively, on the hyperbolic plane, I actually use the triangular group, the group that I call B. So I can identify the H with B if I want to. And then it would be actually simply transitive. And that would be OK. Then, then the volume form on, on H I can identify with a measure on B. So H corresponds to B in some sense. But B is not SL2R, and what is missing is the the K, the SL2. And actually, it's true that every element of SL2R can be written in a unique way as a product of the Borel subgroup, the triangular one, and K, or in other letters, NAK. So it's NAK or Iwasawa decomposition. And if you want to prove it, all you have to do is Gram Schmidt. So let me write down here Gram Schmidt. <coughs> what does Gram Schmidt mean? Gram Schmidt takes two vectors, right? For instance, in R2, in the arbitrary position, and then produces an autonormal basis out of it. What you have to do along the way if you want to produce the autonormal basis, you have to maybe shrink the first vector, maybe stretch the first vector. That's a diagonal transformation. And then, you may have to add or subtract a certain <laughs> multiple of the first basis vector to the second one, and then shrink or 
make bigger again the second one. If you think about this, the n and the k, the n corresponds to uh, adding a certain multiple of the first to the second. The a corresponds to making them smaller or bigger. And what remains is a orthogonal matrix because you have now an orthogonal basis. So Graham Schmidt precisely proves this even Sava decomposition for S2. And the B is the H and the S1 really is the K because the K is S2 which is S1. Um, let's go back to this page here. Let's recall what I said. If we have this fundamental domain, I can use it to define a measure on the surface. By always just pulling back or identifying my, my surface with my fundamental domain and using the measure that I have there. And I do the same with, with psl 2 r but I need to have a measure on psl 2 r And the measure on psl 2 r defined by this formula where I, where m of s1, I fix the uh, identification that the vector pointing north corresponds to the to the zero element in s1, or to, to a particular basis vector in s1, and then other vectors correspond to other angles, and that gives me this identification between T1H and H cross S1, and now I can make this definition. Again, the left SL2R action on, well, let's keep making PSS, PSL2R reserves M PSL two R as defined above. Let's call it above. Why is that? Because I already know that it preserves the volume measure on H. What does the derivative action do? The derivative action that, which corresponds to my left action. My left action is the derivative action coming from the Möbius action. The left psl action acts as it does on the hyperbolic plane and then multiplies at every point with the derivative at that point. What does multiplying mean? It means it rotates the circle but rotating the circle preserves the measure. So I'm preserving the measure. It's, I'm using in the background that the derivative of the Möbius transformation is a complex number. So the tangent vectors are just stretched according to what needs to be stretched and then rotated by some amount. But the amount doesn't matter, it preserves always the measure. i.e. it is the left harm measure. We have identified the left harm measure. On PSL2. So there's another word appearing here. Harm measure. Let me give you a summary of that in two minutes. Every nice group. Has a nice left arm measure. That is very nice. It is um, locally finite. Not equal to the zero measure, open on positive sets, finite on complex sets, it all goes with that, and left invariant.
m of g <coughs> equals m of b. And what's a nice group? A nice group is a locally compact semantic group, sigma compact, and it's all fitting into nice measure theory. All the groups that we, I'm happy to talk about will be locally compact, sigma compact, metric. And now that I've said all of this, I will not talk about that again. So I always have such a nice R measure in that category, which is a theorem that I don't want to prove because it takes another hour and it goes completely besides the direction that I want to talk about. Um, but there's something else that I want to talk about, um, namely that it's almost unique, this measure. For these nice groups, this measure is almost unique. Well, it can't be unique because if I take such a measure and multiply it by two, I have another such measure. It has the same nice properties. So it can only be unique up to scalars, and that's precisely what I mean by almost unique. Up to scalar multiplication, there is a unique such measure. Okay, and we have found it. We have found it for PSL3 using this Ivasala decomposition. Okay, now. What I don't say is what happens to the right multiplication. Here I use left multiplication. I didn't say what happens with right multiplication. And in general, what may happen is that you get another left harm measure. If you, if you multiply your left harm measure on the right, you get a new left harm measure. Well, it can't be that new, right? So can only be a multiple of the old one. So let me write this down. For every g in g, we may define m super g of b as m of b g and check that M super G is another left par measure, which implies that M super G is equal to some function applied to G, some scalar numbers, some real number, multiplied the original par measure. And that's called the modular character. And in particular, it's a character, which means it's a homomorphism to the multiplicative group. Now, some groups have this nice property that makes this modular character trivial. And then, a left harm measure is also a right harm measure. And these groups are called unimodular. A nice group is unimodular if delta G is 1 for every G in G, i.e. if a left arm measure is also a right arm measure. There always also exists a right arm measure, which may be a completely different measure. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm fixing a left arm measure and I'm translating the left harm measure on the right and check then that it's also a left harm measure so it needs to be a multiple. And if this is always the same measure as before, then I know that I have this property. Now, the game is that SL2R is unimodular. You can just check that, right? It's a, it's a three-dimensional thing. 
as I said before, I will drop the P from now on. I will just keep talking about SO2. Um, it's a, we have a three-dimensional thing that we have described by some coordinate system. And we have an action on this coordinate system, which is definitely a smooth action. So you can just take, calculate the Jacobian, right? It's a three-dimensional thing that you have to can calculate the derivative of and take the absolute value of the determinant of the derivative. You can do that. Um, I don't invite you to do that because there's an easier way, which relies on, on the definition of the modular character. This follows because, and this can be easily checked, SL2R is its own commodator. So you can't have homomorphisms that are non-trivial because the group is generated by all its commodators. By which yeah. commodators look like this, GH equal G inverse H inverse GH, G H in S L two R. And let's check this. That, that um, yeah, it's not equal to the set, it's equal to the group generated by the set. That's the definition of the commodator subgroup. And these elements have to be in the kernel of every homomorphism to an abelian group, obviously. And R gross is an abelian group. Delta is a homomorphism, which you can easily check. So these elements are all in the kernel of delta. But since these elements generate S and R, delta is trivial. Which means S and R is a unimodular group. Which means that we can also multiply on the right and preserve the measure. And that's good because then we can keep going afterwards. So let's check this game here. Yeah, so now we are restarting the arguments because we are starting to multiply matrices. Yeah. If you if you go into this topic somehow, one thing you start doing a lot is multiplying matrices. So, yeah. E to the t, e to the minus t, one is one e to the minus t, e to the t, just the inverse of this one, is equal to 1 e to the 2t s1. Just calculate it, which means the commodator of e to the t, e to the minus t, and 1 s1, I probably get messed up, but it's 1 uh, plus minus e to the 2t minus 1 s, something like that. Whether it's plus or minus that, it doesn't really matter because if I take 1 t, which is not equal to 0, and then vary all the s, we immediately see that the commodator group SL2R SL2R contains all the you know, but all these groups and then you do the opposite you do the same calculation with S in another place and you get the same answer with another minus somewhere who cares you get also that it, this that the commodator group contains both of these types of matrices. And then you have another game that says that these two types of matrices generate all of SL2R. And that's important for later anyway. It's generated by Let's call this u plus, which is also n in the previous notation, and this u minus.
<coughs> we do this just by um, restricted Gaussian elimination, if you want to say it like this. You take a G equal A, B, C, D, and you want, want to reduce it to the identity, right? Now, if the, if the C is 0, then I just multiply it on the right by uh, one of these uniform <coughs> matrices to add the, the row here to that row here and to ensure that C is not 0. So let's just suppose that C is not 0. If C is not 0, then I can use one of these matrices, multiply on the right, and add or subtract the multiple of that row to that row to ensure that A becomes 1. Right? By applying a unipotent matrix on the right, I right may correspond to row or column operations, left may correspond to the other. Um, so figure it out. Um, so you can ensure by the right operation that the A is equal to 1. Well, after the A is equal to 1, you do the same and kill the C and now make it 0. And now the D must be 1 because the determinant is 1. And you remain, you stand with a very unipotent matrix that you started with, wanted to work with anyway. So the only thing you can't do is you can't multiply a row from the beginning with something. But you don't have to just by doing enough back and forth operations you achieve precisely this statement using Gaussian elimination. And it works in any dimension. So if we ever want to use this in higher dimensions, we have it out our disposal. OK. SL2R is unimodular, which means the Haar measure that we find there is invariant under both left multiplication and right multiplication. I'm making such a mess of left and right multiplication <coughs> because they really mean different things in our hyperbolic language. The left multiplication corresponds to the isometries that we started off with. They correspond to the Möbius transformations. The right multiplication, we have attached a meaning to the diagonal elements. The diagonal elements from the SL2R on the right correspond to the geodesic flow. That's what we already know. That's already something that we gave a name to somehow. But even the bigger SL2R action on the right makes sense. You can just multiply on the other side as well, and this also deserves the measure. And this somehow puts us in a very similar situation than Then somehow in R2, in R2, or in R, when we took the quotient, we didn't have to worry about left and right and so on. But now that we know that our measure is invariant under both anyway, it again doesn't matter so much. I mean, for certain questions. So the outcome of all of this discussion is the measure m gamma g g mod gamma, that the measure of it is finite and invariant under the right action. We can't any longer talk about the left action. The left action of g on g mod gamma with gamma on the left doesn't make sense any longer. The only thing that would act on the left is something that normalizes gamma. Actually, the normalizer of gamma is trivial, plus minus the identity. So there isn't much on the left acting any longer. But on the right, we have all of g that can act. You should come with the t-shirt tomorrow. Um, you have to argue a bit more to really get that statement. Because somehow with the fundamental domain, but it all works out. It's, it's very easy to check. Think about what you have to check and then check it. It's a homework. But it's, it basically comes from the story that we developed. So maybe I should have asked before. Are there any questions?
Okay. Now, we can start talking about this dynamical system. We have x equal g mod gamma, gamma equals SL to R, SL to Z, and g equals SL to R. And we have here the diagonal transformations. Um, let's again put them with a T over 2. And multiply on the right with these matrices, and they preserve the measure. Now, let me put here a, a theorem notation mark. It's really not a theorem, but the G action on G mod gamma is ergodic, i.e. Every invariant set is trivial or co-trivial M G mod gamma of this invariant set E is zero. Well, I normalize the measure so that measure of the whole space is equal to 1. It's not, so, at first reading it may look like not even, not even a lemma, let alone a theorem. Because it's a transitive action, right? If you're invariant and you're transitive, then you need to be everything or nothing. You don't even need to assume any measurability or something. Either, either you're everything or you're nothing. But after you somehow use the correct definition of invariant, it becomes a, a little bit of a statement yeah. on the order of Fubini. Because invariant is not defined as being strictly invariant. Invariant is defined up to measure zero. So you have to do a little bit of a lemma here too. But the transitivity should kill it. And you may have to use, say, may full be full mini or something, and then you see that it's maybe a lemma, but not a theorem. Now here comes a theorem. And you could even call it R to R team. Um, you could attribute it to R team in, the, in this particular case, but in more general context, maybe the Hopf, the A action. on x, as defined over there, is ergodic. And that's not trivial, because the A action is not transitive. So there's no simple minded argument that tells you that it's, that invariant sets are trivial. Let me Actually, we prove a slightly stronger statement. In fact, and that maybe is off, the action of A1 is a good. A1 being A either the one half, either the minus one half. The time one map in the geodesic though. The argument that our team used was he clarified what's the relationship between the geodesic flow and the Gauss map. He already knew that the Gauss map is ergodic. So from that he got that the geodesic flow is ergodic. But it's the whole flow that gets, it, gets to become ergodic. If you use this argument, then you would have to think a bit harder to see whether this statement is true. But yeah, this we prove. We prove the second statement, which is a stronger statement already in, in the beginning, instead of going through two steps. Um, maybe I should also say that I want to prove this, even though maybe Alex will prove it tomorrow also, but if Alex proves it tomorrow, then he proves it in a different language. And maybe it doesn't hurt to hear the argument in both languages. So I'm using Hobbes' argument, and 
Alex probably will use the modern phenomenon in phrased in terms of unitary representations. But we will see that tomorrow. Okay, how do we do that? Are there any questions to the staging so far? Or to anything? So when your group is continuous and you say a set is invalid, you mean that each element of the group? Each element of the group? Translated. The, diff the, the symmetric, symmetric difference has measure zero. And this null set is varying. Can vary, right? Can vary. And then, I mean, there are, there are definitely invariant sets. Every orbit is an invariant set. But of course, an orbit has measure zero. So it doesn't really screw up anything. Yeah, if, if you have a single element. But if yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, 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 let's say here. Yeah. That's more interesting. So here you have lots of invariant sets, of course. But the game is that these invariant sets are either not measurable, or if they're measurable, then they have measure zero. Um, let me start. Let me today um, give you a cheat proof, a proof that uses a cheat and hence is not a proof. And then maybe tomorrow fix it to make it into a real theorem, a real proof of a theorem. Um, so let's take u equal. 1s1. That's a nice element, right? Um, and it preserves our measure. So we have lots of points f of x and f of xu. What I want to say is that these two are equal. That would be nice to know. Why would that be nice to know? <coughs> if, if I know that, if f of x is equal to f of x u, and I know this for all u of that form, then I probably also know it for all u of the other form. This is in u minus, and then there's the u plus group. If an argument works for u minus, then it probably works for u plus. And these two groups generate all of SO2, and then I can say the G action is transitive or ergodic, and it just killed the statement. So I would like to know that these two are equal. What I know is that this is equal to f of x a n. The, the, the nth power of a1 is a n. And I know that this is equal to f of x u a n. What are you saying about f now? Um, invariant under a one. So I assume precisely this equation. Right then, then you, when I show so you make this function is not the set, right? So function is not the set, set is not a function, but they're basically the same thing, right? If so maybe the proof starts here, still with the quotation mark. Uh, let B be invariant and define F as the characteristic function of me. Thank you. So then this function is invariant. And I have this formula and I have that formula. I left here some space because I want to make it more complicated. And of course it's grouped up somehow with the plus or minus. But now, now I calculate this here, and if my a n, luckily the definition is not on the board any longer, is defined correctly, then this is 1 e to the minus n s 1. I got a minus 1, but never mind. Flip it or use n negative, then it's also fine. Now, why is that good? That's good because this is tiny. If n keeps going, getting smaller, uh, bigger and bigger and bigger, this gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And well, functions are continuous, right? So <laughs> this is always the same and asymptotically equal to that, which is always the same as that. So these must be equal as well. Now. 
I used uniform continuity in this algorithm, right? So even for a continuous function, I, I would have to worry a bit whether I can use this argument because my space is not convex. But if I if I want to prove something is ergodic, then it's important, and I use um, this definition that I have an invariant function and I want to know that this function is almost everywhere constant. If I use this definition, then I'm not allowed to, to restrict myself to continuous functions. That's not what ergodicity means. I need to work with measurable functions. Because my decomposition of the space that we have seen in the morning, this decomposition of the space may not be a nice decomposition of the space. It may be just a dense Borel set and its complement, which is also a dense Borel set. That might be the decomposition that we are seeking. So we shouldn't look for, we shouldn't study continuous functions when we want to prove ergodicity. Unless we want to prove ergodicity using the ergodic theorem, then we can work with continuous functions only. There's some of the, that's sort of the other direction of the ergodic theorem. If you, Study the ergodic averages and you show that they converge to always a constant almost everywhere. Then you have shown ergodicity, and then it's okay to restrict yourself to continuous functions. But in this definition, it's not okay to restrict yourself to continuous functions. So you have to make that correct somehow. And the key word is losing. So tomorrow we will start. Lucifying, lucinifying, whatever, yeah. how you want to say it, this argument, and then you really have the top argument. Um, I could keep talking, but maybe the bus is then gone if I do.